Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Bhagavan Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasari Gaur, Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So we continue on this section, which is a series of verses all about the principles of bhakti in a very direct and very elevated presentation. These verses are really quite powerful, and uh, they are full of many important transcendental uh, topics and within the, the larger topic of bhakti. So we'll continue um, verse number 22. Maya nanyena bhavena. Bhaktim kurvanti e dritam, matrite twakta karmanas, twakta swajana bandavaha. Such a sadhu engages in staunch devotional service to the Lord without deviation. For the sake of the Lord, he renounces all other connections, such as family relationships and friendly acquaintances within the world. Hmm purported by his divine grace. A person in the renounced order of life, a sannyasi is called a sadhu because he renounces everything. Uh, his home, his comfort, his friends, his relatives, and his duties to friends and family. He renounces everything for the sake of the supreme personality of Godhead. A sannyasi is generally in the renounced order of life, but his renunciation will be successful only when his energy is employed in the service of the Lord with great austerity. It is said here, therefore, Bhaktim Korvanti e Dhritam, a person who seriously engages in the service of the Lord and is in the renounced order of life, is a sadhu. The sadhu is one who has given up all responsibility to society, family, and worldly humanitarianism simply for the service of the Lord. As soon as he takes his birth in the world, a person has so many responsibilities and obligations to the public, to the demigods, to the great sages to general living beings, to his parents, to family, forefathers, and to many others. When he gives up all such obligations for the sake of the service of the Supreme Lord, he is not punished for such renunciation of obligation. But if for sense gratification, a person renounces all such obligations, he is punished by the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. wow. So let's reference this to another verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 5th chapter, uh, verse number 41, 11.541. And we'll get a clear understanding of the what Prabhupada is uh, saying in terms of the particular verse here. 11.541. Devarsi Bhutatma Nirna Pratignam Nakinkana Nayan Renitya Rajam Sarvatmanam Yasaranam Saranyam Kato Mukundam Pratiritya Kartam. Translation O King, one who has given up all material duties and has taken full shelter of the lotus feet of Mukunda, who offers shelter to all, is not indebted to the demigods, great sages, or non living beings, relatives, friends, mankind or even forefathers who have passed away. Since all classes of living entities are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, one who has surrendered to the Lord's service and has no need to serve such persons separately. So here is a confirmation of the previous verse and purport by Srila Prabhupada, in which is saying that when we come into this world, and it's a fact, we are already in debt. 
As soon as we are born, we are in debt to our parents. As soon as we appear, we are in debt to the society we live in. We are in debt to the forefathers who are coming before us. We are indebted to the material energy who provides air, water, sunshine, and the natural things that are necessary for us to live. All these things are given automatically. We are also indebted to the demigods who look after the universal affairs of which we are part of. So there's a whole list of debting, uh, debtors that we have to pay. So people who are not aware of this, they're always being implicated in reactions. Prabhupada gives an example in a very mundane way that, um, you know, if you don't <laughs> pay your electrical bill, uh, after some time, they cut off your power. <laughs> so you have to pay the bill. So in the same way, we're getting free sunshine. So, uh, you know, somebody's providing that. And obviously, it's the Supreme Lord himself. So we become debtor to the demigods who are actually working under the Lord, who give us the sunshine, rain, and other amenities that come by way of material energy, the sadhus who give us knowledge of the scriptures. And so the whole list of debting debtors is something that automatically comes when we take birth. But this verse confirms what Srila Prabhupada is saying in the verse for, the, for today that if one takes shelter, and of course the word is full shelter, of the Supreme Personality of God in devotional service, then because all these other living entities are parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord, they are energies of the Lord, they, are, they come from the Lord, they are not disconnected because everything is under the control of the Lord, either directly or indirectly. So one who fully surrenders to the Lord is relieved from all the debts. <laughs> all debts. Sometimes we see devotee, devotees come to devotional service and they feel, well, I still have family responsibilities. I still have this responsibility. I still have this responsibility. But if one comes and begins by engaging fully in devotional service, then if they stay in that position, they can they free themselves for all personal, familial, familial, sociological, ecological, um, demagogical, and demagogical, and all obligations that we are given. Uh, by way of people who are doing things for us automatically, simply by our, by our presence, all that is no longer applicable. In other words, as long as we serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then we are free from all other debts. And I've seen that many times. Sometimes devotees hesitate to get involved in devotional service because of material responsibilities. But you should know that the more you take shelter of Krishna, the more your material responsibilities become an asset in your devotional life and you're no longer a debtor to it, but you use these things in the service of the Lord also. In some cases you give them up and in other cases you may dovetail them in the service of the Lord. But in either case, they don't control you anymore nor are you responsible to them but they uh, but can be used for the service of the Lord. Or in the case of here, the sannyasi, he might give up all of it, his home, his comfort, friends, relatives, family, everything. And uh, that one who fully surrenders in the, in the renounced order of life, he's completely free from all obligations. And uh, those former obligations that he was connected to uh, also benefit by that person taking to Krishna consciousness. We also understand that it's true that if, just like in the family sometimes 
the children become interested in Krishna consciousness, but not the parents. So the children are making progress, following nicely. Now their parents are benefiting from that, and it's called the Gyata Sukriti. It means that they don't even realize that they're getting benefits from it, but it's happening by way of the connection with those who are family members. So therefore, one who fully surrenders to anything, just like we say, So we're glorifying Srila Rupa Goswami as being the well-wisher of all living entities. Why? Even though he never left Vrindavan, he was always stayed in Vrindavan, because of the power of his devotional service to the Supreme Lord, he is actually benefiting the whole world. This is the power of devotional service. Not only are we material responsibilities no longer applicable, departments, who that person was connected with, and even those that are not connected with, depending on the power of that person's devotional life, they benefit also. They're getting, they're getting that. We have the example of Dhruva Maharaj. When Dhruva Maharaj had reached perfection, he was on his way back to Godhead. The uh, airplane came from the spiritual world to take him. But when the... Uh, when the residents of the spiritual world had come with the airplane, he said to them, you know, I'm not going unless my mother goes. Because his mother had, was the person that brought him to Krishna consciousness. So he felt very really indebted to his mother. And they said, uh, Dhruva, just look to your left. And he did. And there was his mother getting in a similar airplane on her way back to the spiritual world. So that, what did she do? Nothing really in the real sense of the word. She was an ordinary lady. She was, of course, a queen connected with King Uttanapada. But she had a son who was a great devotee of the Lord and who qualified to, become, to, be, to go back home back to Godhead. And because of her connection with him, she also got that benefit. And so this is how devotional service works. So Devotees get confused a lot of times where they think they have to take care of all responsibilities and they push their devotional service aside to do this or to do that or to do this and to do that. And they just waste time when they could be actually making more and more advancement because Krishna takes care of his devotees. He takes care of the devotees. It's not that he neglects the devotee who surrenders to them. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, if I give up my material responsibilities, what will happen to me? Prabhupada talks about the, um, the man who is elderly. Now he's lived his whole life with his family. Now he wants to go to Vrindavan. So uh, because he has some money, he's on his way to Vrindavan. Setting, bringing the money to Krishna in Vrindavan to be used for devotional service. He leaves it with his family so they can have money to live on. So he's still connected with the family. He's still, he talks about leaving the family and going to Vrindavan and taking up devotional service, but he still has his family connections by maintaining them. So this is, this is how people, they can't seem to understand how uh, exclusive that devotional service is so powerful that it benefits everyone. And the person who is engaged in devotional service no longer has any material responsibilities. They're no longer a debtor. They're no longer a, in any, any sense of the word. And that verse we read from the uh, 11th Canto is very much quoted by Srila Prabhupada as a foundational verse for those who are thinking, you know, what about my family? What about this? What about that? If I take the devotional service, what about this? What about that? No, devotional service works in such a way that the more you serve the Lord, the more anything connected with you or has been connected with you 
will also get the benefit of that devotional service. So this is a very uh, important, and of course, for those who are in a renounced order of life, say they've never been married, but they may also have some friends and relatives somewhere in the world. It's like uh, there was one sannyas god brother of mine. Um, he left his um, family when his wife, uh, when he was very young, and he had a very young daughter at the time. She was only four years old. So he left, he left everything to take sannyas. And then his wife and daughter never saw him again. And then 35 years later, his daughter appears in his life and she wants to know who her father is and she tracks him down and finds out who he is. And he's a renounced sadhu and he's very renounced in terms of his devotional life. So now she's interested in him. So he gives her some time, but what does he do? He tries to teach her about devotional service like that. So she becomes interested in his life and then she also gets some benefit like that. So yeah, um, in every life we have a family, in every life we have a different body, in every life we have a set of relatives, we have a country, we have so many things and we lose that life and we change to the next life and we get a whole new set of family members and friends and if we don't make it to the human form of life, we have a, we have, we have our family members who bark like dogs or, or oink like pigs or something like that. So, you know, we always get family members. They could be in any form. And so uh, family is important when it's Krishna conscious, but when it's not Krishna conscious, then it is simply a, as it says in the Shastras, one should better to live in the forest than be in a material family life where one simply is dragged down in the responsibilities to maintain the body and the extensions of the body in terms of family members. So make your family Krishna conscious and then that family becomes like that. And everyone benefits in, by becoming Krishna conscious and you benefit your family members by becoming a devotee of the Lord also. They also gain Everyone gains from each other in that connection like this. But if one decides to give up everything and take sannyas, of course, sometimes that's important and necessary, and sometimes it's not. In certain Srila Prabhupada's entourage of his disciples, there were many who wanted to give up. Taking sannyas during Prabhupada's time was very fashionable. Many of the leading devotees at the time were eager for sannyas. Prabhupada was always wondering why so many of his disciples wanted to take sannyas. Well, a lot of times they, they, for whatever reason, but sometimes Prabhupada said, no, you stay with your family. And then after some time you take care, you take that responsibility, you can preach and become a devotee in your family, but make sure you're following the principles of family life. And in some cases he saw that it wasn't beneficial to stay in the family. The person wanted to take sannyas. Prabhupada was eager to give them that next step in life. Like that. But once you take the next step, don't look back. That's the point. Um, so Prabhupada says, well, if a sannyasi, and he's preaching, and he's, he's going out and he's meeting different people, and he comes to a nice house with people who have a wealth, nice family members, the man is there, the wife is there, the children are there, now everything is nice. And he thinks, oh, you know, if I didn't take sannyas, I could have, I could have lived, be living like this too. Prabhupada said, as soon as he thinks like that, he's fallen. He's already fallen from his spiritual uh, position. So uh, as we take the Krishna consciousness, renunciation becomes automatically more and more a part of a devotee's life. They see the world for what it is, and, uh, and, uh, a place where we simply have to struggle in order to maintain the body and the extensions of the body. 
like that. So as one makes advancement in spiritual life, one becomes more and more uh, detached from all these things. Uh, again, um, it depends on one's situation, whether they should stay in the family, maintain the family, become a good grihasta, and preach to other grihastas and others, or come to the point of renouncing all family and sociological ties, and uh, ultimately uh, going 100% in devotional service. So we have four orders, grihasta, brahmachari, vanaprasta, and sannyas. So two of them, three of them actually, brahmachari, grihasta, uh, brahmachari uh, sannyas, and vanaprasta means total renunciation. And uh, grihasta is allowed to live in that family life, but not like grihamedi. Grihamedi means they center their whole life around their family. And then they feel that their family is everything. So they live simply for the family and for the benefit of the family members. They simply work in order to fulfill that. So real spiritual life means to spiritualize uh, whatever material activities you have and then offer that to Krishna and then become what we say Krishna conscious. Krishna conscious means the responsibilities that we have become an opportunity to serve the Lord rather than an entanglement in material life. So, um, but it, even those in Grihasta life who are living, trying to become Krishna conscious in Grihasta life, we should, should be very aware of following very carefully the principles that govern detachment, because if we remain attached in family life in the name of Krishna consciousness, then uh, we will be forced to take another birth somewhere in the material world. It might be a better birth, might be a lower birth, but in any case, another birth, nothing is guaranteed because we don't have a say on what body we get after we leave this particular body. So we have to be very aware of the principles that govern Grihasta life and follow them very carefully. Carefully means that uh, we always keep Krishna in the center and live by religious principles and not by uh, mundane moral and uh, ethical principles that people adopt in order to somehow or other further their position in the material world. That's not... Bhakti Vinoda Kaur talks about the, the, the uh, mundane moralist. The mundane moralist. He's moral. He's a nice person. He does good to others. Why? Because he knows it'll push him forward in his material success. Be, to be a, a good guy in order to become successful in this material world. Yeah. So that is not the focus. The focus is to become Krishna conscious. Of course, one who has, is Krishna conscious is automatically following all good qualities, which are the qualities of the mode of goodness. But we have to be very much aware because there are those in Grihastha life who at the same time still want to maintain material attachments at the same time uh, engage in devotional service, thinking that the success of my devotional service is, is shown by how successful I am in material life. And you'll see that that's being propagated in many religious society. If you have a nice family, and you have wealth, you have position, you have so many things in the material world and you're worshiping God occasionally in your churches or synagogues or wherever, if you're doing that, it says, whoa, yeah, this is an indication you are being favored by God. That's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true because the, the idea is to get out of this material world. That's why our movement is not so much, very much appreciated by a lot of people because we don't accept uh, material um, 
uh, what we say, what's the word, material um, benefits as success in spiritual life. They can be used for Krishna consciousness, just like we can use difficulties in Krishna consciousness also. So, uh, yeah, so a sadhu here is mentioned in the sannyasa of the life, but a sadhu can also be a grihasta. Um, Bhakti Vinotar Kaur talks about um, uh, grihasta paramahansa. Now, this is an interesting term. Coming from a grihasta, who is an elevated person, Bhakti Vinotar Kaur. Bhakti Vinotar Kaur was a was a magistrate for the, the British Raj, a very respectable position. Uh, at the same time, he had a large family, many children. Uh, he, uh, but he was, a, you know, a great devotee of the Lord. So his his thing was manaso ge deho geho yo kichu more arpilu to avdede. Nanda Kishur, he says, he prays, and he writes in one of his bhajans, Oh Nanda Kishur Krishna, my home, my wife, my possessions, my very body, it belongs to you. I'm engaged in your service with all of these things. So Bhakti Vinotakur, although he had a lot of worldly responsibilities and a big family, he was a great devotee of the Lord because he used everything in the service of the Lord. And his goal was to, you know, per perfect his life and go back home, back to Godhead. So that should be our goal. And uh, it doesn't matter what uh, lifestyle you have or what ashram you're in, as long as you keep the goal in life, I want to go back home, back to Godhead. I want to develop my love for Krishna then you are a sadhu. <laughs> that is an actually definition of a sadhu. A sadhu is one who uses all their energy for the service of the Lord. Okay. Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for the wonderful class today, Guru Maharaj. I request devotees if they have any questions or comments or realizations, they can go ahead, please. Anyone? Deepthi Mataji, you, you have a question? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All Krishna Allah Prabhupada. Thank you so much Guru Maharaj for the wonderful class on this. I wanted to check so that if, if we are in basically in Grasta Ashram, it's okay to have attachment with the family and uh, but uh, as long as we are in consciousness of krishna basically and attachment, uh, attachment is based on the, the the relationships we have with each other <clears throat> we have to see we see we have to work on the spiritual platform and in connect the material relationships on that platform. Everyone is a spirit soul. Everyone belongs to Krishna. But we play the roles in this world as family members, mother, father, son, daughter. These are roles we play. You have to understand this is a role. Yes. It's not our real identity. In one life, we could be a mother. In the next life, we could be a father. Next life, we could be, you know, a different type of family member. So we get different roles 
as we sojourn in this material world. And we have to play the material role. We have to play that role. So in playing that role, there is naturally affection for family members. But if that affection is material, material means we dispense with the spiritual and focus on the material. Yes. So Guru Maharaj, if this is what I've sometimes, if we play that role as thinking that uh, every soul is part and parcel of Krishna and their spirit soul, and uh, then that becomes more of a duty than, you know, than doing your service. Like, for example, if, like with my son, I always feel like he's my duty, you know, it's my responsibility to give him good education and, you know, um, so that he, he can progress, uh, like, you know, uh, spiritually as well. He gets understanding and everything. But uh, then that affection doesn't build up. So it just feels like, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it in the words, but it just... You still have to be a mother too. Yeah. Yeah, you play your role as a mother up to a certain age. And then as he moves on in life, then you're still a mother, but you play that role differently. That's all. Mm. You're always his mother, at least in this particular sarjohn. And you have to, you know, you can't give up your role as a mother and just be a renunciate sitting in the corner chanting Hare Krishna. And then the family doesn't get anything to eat. Um, the, the place stays dirty. <laughs> that doesn't work. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Guru You have to play both roles. One of them is the real role, the selves, to come to that full consciousness. But in the material world, it's a, like, it's a transitional role. Mm. You know, it's like if you get on a stage in a particular drama, you know who you are, but at the same time, you might have to play in a, uh, someone else in the play. So in order for the play to go on nicely, you have to know your lines in the play and put your heart into working in that play in the best possible way. But, you know, you know, it's only a play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this world is like a play. We're playing these different roles. But still, it doesn't mean we give up attachment to family members and, and dispense with the roles we have to play. We play the roles, but we have to know who we are. Mm. Just basically doing the acting are, of, uh, you know, in every role, you, you're just acting basically uh, as being material the material level. We're acting on the spiritual level. We're actually performing in, in our mm. natural position. Yes. So uh, I'll give you a more of a exact thing in, like, in your relationship to your child. So you have to be the mother. So mother means also maybe being a disciplinarian and in some areas. And there's also affection for the child. That's also there. But at the same time, if you don't give them Krishna consciousness, then as it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, don't become mother, no, don't become father, don't become guru, don't become teacher if you cannot, you know, deliver your disciples, children, uh, students from the cycle of birth and death. So the scriptures give very strong uh, responsibilities on people who are in a, who are in a leadership role and, and people who are underneath them depend on them. So you can take care of your children's body and mind, but if you neglect them as the soul, then you're, you're, you're cheating them. Mm. And if you just give them spiritual life, but there's no food on the table, there's no, there's, the house is not clean or anything on, in, in the role as a mother, if you neglect that, then that may also make it difficult for you to perform your spiritual duty. You have to balance that, that is to balance. Now, if you don't want to balance, then, the, then there's another ashram, it's called the Sanasra Ashram. <laughs> You just focus completely on devotional service and then you don't have no responsibilities with family members at all. That's what this verse is about. Mm. Yeah. 
But for ladies, that comes maybe in the later part of life. Once they are through with their material responsibilities, then they can take a type of sannyas where they live in the holy places and they simply devote themselves to worshiping the deity 100%. Like that. But that comes for ladies, that comes usually in later part of life. And men, you know, men can take sannyas at any time in life. Of course, it's also recommended that they also take it in, in a more later stage. Prabhupada gave it in an early stage because he needed to have that kind of ashram alive in order for him to spread Krishna. But so Prabhupada took a chance. He took a chance because generally it says you take sannyas when, you, when you're usually about 50 years old. Baba was giving sannyas to people in their 20s. Wow. And uh, so Papa had he he knew it was a risk, but due to the situation, he he took that risk and at the same time he tried to help them stay fixed in their devotional service. And many of them didn't make it. Many made it and many didn't make it. Prabhupada took that risk. That was a risk that he took because mm -hmm. he was, he didn't have much time left. He was elderly and he knew that in order to spread Krishna consciousness, he had to have the sannyasa order. So he took that chance. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So in this Guru Maharaj, you know, we always feel that, you know, Krishna's devo devotional services is always pleasing and it's a, it's so blissful that so many times you drift yourself and uh, you just, uh, it happens, you don't want it, but it happens that you, uh, that some point or some time you do neglect your family and uh, you're just too busy in your uh, own world, maybe you should say. <laughs> so how do we, what do we? You just have to learn what works. You first you have to know the principles and then you know, have to know how to apply those principles. Hmm. If you're not sure, how to apply them, you should know how, you should know them, that you can learn. If you don't know how to apply them, then you get help from other Grihastas who are successful, who are doing the same thing, who have somehow mastered their, their role as a Grihasta. Because mm. it's, you know, you're in, you're in the material energy and at the same time you have to be somewhat aloof from the attractions of the material energy. Thank you for but the for very helpful. Just do your, you know, take care of your family nicely. That's Krishna conscious. That's also mm. your service to Krishna. Mm. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj, this was a very uh, deep class and uh, a little heavy class also, I would think. <laughs> <because> <laughs> it's uh, really, you know, hitting straight home that human life is so valuable and we might miss the chance if we get caught up in, you know, attached family, which is a very strong thing. So my question is, the scriptures say that, uh, you know, after the age of 50, we give up family life and focus more on uh, the devotional service of the Lord, austerities, penances, purification. So, is that to be considered that Vanaprastha stage is a, 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 a en route to sannyas stage? We must undertake that, thinking that we must progress to sannyas. Is that for everyone? Or no, no, the sannyas is only for men. There was a, a movement in our movement to make women sannyasis, it went on for a while, but nowhere in the scriptures is that. Uh, given any kind of authorization. So women can take, can be renounced and you'll find that there are many women that are very renounced 
extremely renounced. And I know some of them where they are and that they're very, they're fully engaged in devotional service. So that, that's considered to be bond of Prost. But for a lady, that's the, that's the perfection. And what do they do? They somehow or other connect themselves with some temple, some holy place, and serve the deity and the devotees in that, in that environment. So you're on your way to Mayapur. As soon as you get there, you'll understand everything. Okay, Guru Thank you very much. With your mercy and blessings only, Guru Maharaj. You have too many attachments in America. Yes, Guru Maharaj, that is true. One of the ways to get rid of attachments is just to leave them. Okay, Guru Maharaj. I'm, I'm, I'm going to book my tickets. Good. <laughs> this is your desire anyway, so I'm just reminding you. Yes, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> it's so difficult. The material energy, you know, has so many allurements, and then your mind will come up with so many excuses why you cannot do this, cannot do that. And it seems, you know, much more pressing to take care of that particular thing and that particular thing and this particular thing. And it's just very, very entangling, very entangling. Mm, yeah, it, it, it says that the material energy is endlessly mutable. And that's a statement from, from Bhagavad Gita, endlessly mutable. Mutable means changeable, constantly changing, constantly moving. It's not so easy to become Krishna conscious. It's a, it's a big if you, struggle. If you focus on the positive, it becomes a lot easier. If you try to get rid of the negative, it's much harder. Yes, Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisance is to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jai Mayapur Dam Ki Jai. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. You My have your you have your service, you have your association, you have your deities, everything is there. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very and, much. Yeah, your whatever struggles you're going through now is simply due to due to association, that's all. Okay. It's not really your heart, your heart's in Mayapur, but due to the association, all these things really kind of get reawakened again. Mm -hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. That's all. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Diptesh Prabhuji, you can go ahead with your question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. I think as Sri Devi Mataji said, uh, today's lecture and the content was heavy, but yet very important to understand from a Siddhanta perspective. Um, so whilst Maharaj, I think uh, I had some questions which were partly answered before. Uh, uh, so yet we have a duty of care to our parents. Um, now, yes, we need to be serving them without attachment, but we still have a duty of care towards them because if we don't, I mean, this is my, uh, I mean, one way of presenting, if we don't, then doesn't it reflect back on Krishna consciousness as a whole uh, following the process, but also because, I mean, if they are not really an hindrance uh, to your spiritual life, then there is a duty of care and, and, and they should, should be taking yeah. that seriously. Yeah, Otherwise, a, it reflects it bad. A, yeah, it's a responsibility. Lord Chaitanya told Raghunath Das Goswami to stay and, stay and take care of his parents. And at one time, Krishna will free him. But if we're looking for comfort or sense gratification in our material responsibilities, then we're, we're, we're associating with the material energy. We do it as a duty. There may also be uh, some affection there, but it's a duty. That's the main thing. A real duty is uh, uh, 
there's a, a real duty is to become Krishna conscious. So make sure that whatever material responsibilities you have doesn't take you away from your focus on Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. And Maharaj, we also have a, a duty. Uh, I wouldn't say a duty, but it's the other way around. But if the parents are not Krishna conscious, or not, then it's also our duty to give them Krishna consciousness in some form or shape that they are, they are that's acceptable to them. To what level you then actually try to give them uh, if, if they are not favorable, for example, or, or, or to what level you push it with them? especially the parents. Well, you, you, have to, you have to try at least until you realize that you've tried everything and then you just leave it in the hands of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to people who are elderly. The scriptures say you can't teach old, old dog new tricks. <laughs> the, the older the people get, the more they're set in their ways. They don't change so easy. Even if they like it and they know it's right, because of their conditioning, they can't change. They don't want to change. They don't see the need for change. Yeah, that's so true, Maharaj. Yes. So, you know, do your best. That's all you can say, huh? Prahlad Maharaj tried to save his father, Harani Kashi Puh. He preached to his father, he loved his father. He told his father, you know, you're in Maya. <laughs> your best friend, you've made your, wor your worst enemy. Krishna is your best friend and you're turning, making him your worst enemy. His father didn't want to hear anything. In fact, he became more angry. But Pallad Maharaj was, you know, he did it because he was concerned about his father. That's all. Thank you. This this uh, clarifies. Um, so thank you for this topic. It's so relevant, important uh, to understand and put it into practice, especially for the grihasthas. Yeah, yeah. Just try to remember Krishna. That's all. <laughs> that's the, that's yena kena yena yena tena prakarena mana Krishna nivesaya. The verse from Sri, uh, from uh, Padma Puran, I think. No, from Nectar Devotion. Yena kena puka reina, mana Krishna nivesa. Somehow or other, remember Krishna. <laughs> Whatever you do, remember Krishna. Whether you're serving your parents or you're, you know, doing your daily puja, remember Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Sudha Mataji, uh, you can go ahead next. Oh, Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you, Mataji. Um, Hare Krishna, Dhanud Pranam, um, uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, I have a um, question. I mean, uh, as Mataji Prabhuji mentioned, uh, today's class is like, uh, I feel like it's very heavy for me too. Uh, so, I need to go and listen to uh, this lecture again. Uh, so Maharaj, just I'm trying to understand the difference between like a, a material and also the love and attachment. Like uh, Maharaj uh, mentioned, like affection should not be material. So when it comes to like uh, raising kids, uh, so we are trying to raise kids in a, um, uh, to make them Krishna consciousness uh, uh, so that uh, they can become responsible and become a Krishna conscious kids and work for the welfare of the society. So in this process also, uh, we are actually developing attachment and love towards uh, them. Uh, so how should we identify this love uh, um, uh, with them like is it like a material or like uh, what level Maharaj no it's, it's if you're trying to give them Krishna conscious it's not material 
and mm -hmm. you know just like my god sister she was uh, she had a young child two years old so um she was also doing deity worship she wrote a letter saying that she was having a difficulty be, uh, balancing her schedule between the deity worship and taking care of her child and Prabhupada basically told her you know child worship is more important than deity worship he said you know you may have to give up your deity worship but you cannot give up taking care of your children that is the responsibility of the mother the mother so that's 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 across the board as a mother you have to do your duty to your children make sure you give them what they need to live nicely and it may also look like material but if it's food if it's affection if it's um, um, some kind of health care or education. That's part of life. But you shouldn't think that that's the success of life. It's just needed. That's all. It's necessary. Success is to become Krishna conscious. So, therefore, in the Grihasta Ashra, it becomes a concern how to balance our material responsibilities with our spiritual practice. Along with giving that same spiritual direction to children. It's like when you develop Krishna consciousness in the family, the affection for the family members is not decreased. It's fact, they increased. It's only when the family is not all united in Krishna consciousness does it become a problem. Then it's a problem. The idea is to bring everyone on board and take care of your material responsibilities, come together as a family, have kirtan, read Prabhupada's books together, do some seva together. Nothing is left out. Okay, Maharaj. So uh, when we do that, Maharaj, it's not called attachment. No. Uh, as, long as, you, as long as you keep Krishna in the center, that's all. Okay, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. Okay, Maharaj. Yeah, thank yeah. You. I mean, you, you, it's you, not attached to your family, then then it's a problem. You have to be attached in the right way. That's all. Oh, okay, Maharaj. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like my happiness is my kid, you know, gets a good job. That's not my happiness. My happiness is the kid becomes a devotee. That's my happiness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, Maharaj. Yeah. But if he gets a good job and becomes a devotee, then that's that's also nice. <laughs> mm. Yes, yes, Maharaj. You have to try to understand how to balance these two responsibilities. Mm. And it's not so clear. It comes by way of... Uh, trial and error and at the same time it comes by way getting guidance from others so we can learn from other successful families mm -hmm. now when you start a little late in life and your children are already grown up and they're coming to krishna consciousness when they're a little older then it's a little bit more of an effort to try to convince them that now this is your lifestyle and you're trying to bring them into it also. So you do your best to bring them in. But if it doesn't work, then that doesn't mean you give up your Krishna conscious. Mm. You stay Krishna conscious. Then you have something to give to others. 
Yes, Maharaj. Yes, I got that uh, point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, just uh, one more question about like uh, just trying to understand the difference between the duty and debt. So Maharaj, you mentioned like when you come to Krishna consciousness, you are not like indebted to anyone. But uh, still we have our duties uh, towards parents and uh, children. Um, so uh, that means like uh, uh, like parents like they are very far in india and we are not able to do our duty so we feel we have that guilt in the heart like uh, i mean like we came here and you're not taking a good responsibility of them so how should we handle this marriage i mean should we consider it's like um, since we came to krishna consciousness we should not uh, have that guilt or like um, well, you can't, you can't, you know, go back in time. You have to work from where you are, that's all. But again, community is very essential as a support factor. Therefore, devotees should associate together. Find devotees living in your area and um, go to classes, have programs, go to kirtans. Whenever the children can, bring them along if they can. Mm -hmm. They also make devotee friends a lot of times. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, don't lament about what didn't happen. Just work with what you got now. That's all. <laughs> okay. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. I need to work on that. I have so, uh, so much of lamentation. <laughs> I always think about I should have to done this and that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely, I'll work. Everything on is right there in front of you now. You just have to learn how to use it. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, all your blessings. That's why we have yeah, again. It comes back to, comes back to association. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Um, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Um, on that, um, uh, Mataji, Mataji, Sudha Mataji's question is very nice. And uh, she uh, she was mentioning about the attachments uh, with the family and all. So, uh, um, Guru Maharaj, so we have some attachments with devotees also, Guru Maharaj. Like, um, uh, so we are also nowadays uh, we associate more with devotees only and uh, we get attached to them also. So what kind of attachment will it be, Guru Maharaj? That's good. That attachment is good. Attachment to devotees is uh, elevating. And if you remember the previous verse, or I think two verses before in our series of verses here, Attachment to the material uh, brings one down. Attachment to the spiritual brings one up. Attachment to devotees will bring you up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can develop relationships with devotees, with different kinds of friendly relationships. Share Krishna consciousness together. You can also, you know, sometimes you talk about you both have similar activities in this world, so that becomes uh, a source of bonding with others. Yes, good yeah. Don't forget Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yena kena pakarena mana krishna nivesa yet somehow or other. Remember Krishna. That's good, Manish. That's true. I'll, uh, we'll, I'll, I'm always getting carried away with all my services, and uh, suddenly I'll remember for whom I'm doing this. <laughs> so, <laughs> some, as you said, I have to remember Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, and remember why you're doing what you're doing. It's for Krishna, it's for helping the devotees. 
service is always beneficial. Even if it's not perfect, it's always beneficial. Yes, Find ways to serve the devotees. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Any more questions or comments? I think, uh, Guru Maharaj, we are past one hour and uh, I think there are no more questions now. I think we can end the call here if you Okay. Can. All right, we can stop here and tomorrow we'll continue with verse number 23, I think. Yes, we'll continue. I think we're going to go to 26 and then to, in between there, there may be some other, other classes. Um, I, I believe I give class at the, the temple here on Sunday morning, which is really early for people in America. I don't think it's possible, but the class will be recorded anyway, so that'll be uh, it starts at uh, 8 o'clock CET time, which is about 1 o'clock in the morning, your time. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't sleep that night. You, can, <laughs> you watch my class and then you can go to sleep immediately after that. <laughs> you, might even, you might even fall asleep during the class. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to the recording and uh, post it for the uh, group yeah. also. Just post it on the calendar. Eight o'clock, I think it's, I think it's uh, eighth canto, chapter one, verse number, I think seven, eight one seven. That's good match. Somewhere it might be eight one eight or something, but it's in that area, or maybe even even something else. I don't know. Depends on whether. I don't think there's too many purports in that first verse of the eighth canto. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the association. Nice class today. Thank you. Thank you all devotees for joining us. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you. Hare Krishna.